Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. An investigation underway, a shooter on the loose. What San Antonio police know about an early morning shooting at a motel on the city's west side. They took away her American dream. A California family demanding answers after their innocent 14 year old daughter was shot by Los Angeles police. This story ahead in your morning headlines. Are you sniffling sore throat itchy eyes coming up? A local allergist has details on how to tell the difference between COVID and South Texas allergies as the pollen count hits extreme levels in the San Antonio metro area. And this is a live look at the San Antonio Food Bank this morning where both teams playing in the Alamo Bowl tonight are doing a little volunteer work before the big game. A live report coming up. And a good morning to you. It is Wednesday, December 29th. So happy to be here this Wednesday morning. Again, I'm doing that thing where we weren't sure what day it was. We're not sure. It's, not, it's December yeah. 29th. I know we read the, the date, but we're still, it's not, yeah. we're not processing. Yeah, Christmas was on Saturday. Saturday, right? New Year's is on Saturday. It's on Saturday. See, it's two Saturdays, so it's extra confusing. Yeah, so if you're just waking up because uh, you're enjoying your time <laughs> off, stay in the stretchy pants. Mm -hmm. Yes. Know. So we've been here since early this morning, and as we go outside with live cam, one of the big problems earlier was fog and mist. Where are we at with that, Katie Blake? Mm -hmm. We've still got some lingering fog. It was It's not quite as dense as it was early this morning. I'm talking 3 to 5 a.m. or so. But still looking a little bit gloomy out there and a dense fog advisory will be in place until 10 a.m. So for another hour or so. So if you'll be heading out this hour, you may run into some fog. Remember to use those low beam headlights. So uh, speaking of kind of feeling like oh, whether it's the holidays or mountain cedar, maybe a combination of both. Here is today's pollen count. We do have some improvement. Doesn't look like it at first glance, but yesterday's mountain cedar count was over 21,000. So in comparison, 14,920 is great, right? Kind of, sort of, still very high. Molds are moderate today with a count of 730. So it is the season for mountain cedar to be an issue. We're still in the upper 60s at the airport, still overcast, lingering patchy fog, a little bit of mist as well. That will continue to clear up as the morning goes on. And as we get into the afternoon, we will see some sun. We've also got, believe it or not, a slight drop in humidity coming later on today. I'll walk you through that forecast and what's going on there. By Friday, New Year's Eve, it will be warm and muggy again, so you won't need to bundle up for any Friday evening plans. You might have and our strong cold front for late Saturday is still on schedule. We'll talk about all this and more in just a little bit. Guys, back to you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, you know, this morning with the fog, we really didn't have a lot of incidents, but we're going to keep a close eye on that at this time. Remember, if you are heading out, be aware the, fo the fog is still sticking around. A little mild, though. Let's check on your top stories in today's nine at nine. The U.S. flu season has officially begun. Hospitalizations are rising and two child deaths have been reported. Last flu season was the lowest in decades. According to the CDC, at least seven states are considered to have high flu activity. Texas is not one of them. Police are still looking for a gunman who fired into a North Texas convenience store, killing three teenagers. Authorities arrested a person they thought was the 14-year-old suspect, but they now believe they have the wrong person. Police say two of the teenage victims were innocent bystanders. Former Democratic Nevada Senator Harry Reid has died after a four-year battle with pancreatic cancer. His wife says he died peacefully, surrounded by family. Reid was 82. Dozens of people are recovering after their Greyhound bus crashed in central Utah. The bus was traveling from Green River, Utah to Las Vegas and was only about 50 miles into the trip. The Highway Patrol says 37 passengers and a driver are on board and 32 of them were taken to area hospitals. None of the injuries are life threatening. Mexico's tourism secretary says cruise ships carrying passengers who tested positive for COVID-19 will be allowed to dock in Mexican ports. The secretary also says passengers who test positive or have any symptoms will be able to receive medical attention at Mexico's hospitals. American Airlines is getting a new chief, Robert Isom, taking over as CEO at the end of March after Doug Parker retires. Isom will have a number of problems on his plate and he's vowing to improve the airline's operation and return it to profitability. 
People with expired passports will be allowed to return to the U.S. The State Department says American citizens can travel back with certain expired passports until the end of March 2022. The exception applies to those whose passports expired on or after January 1st, 2020. A new wearable is hoping to break into the fitness marketplace. Tech company Mavano unveiled its Smart Ring. Like many other similar products, the ring will measure things like heart rate, sleep, respiration, and blood oxygen levels. The ring goes on sale late next year. The 2021 Alamo Bowl kicks off tonight right here in downtown San Antonio. The Oklahoma Sooners will go head to head with the Oregon Ducks. Kickoff scheduled for 8.15 p.m. Oklahoma is favored by seven points. And that's today's nine at nine. Well, this morning's top story, San Antonio police say a man was shot while confronting two men who he believed previously robbed him. This happened around four this morning at a Motel 6 off Southwest Loop 10, not far from Marbach. That's where police say they found a man in his 30 shot in the leg and back. He was taken to University Hospital in critical condition. Officers tell us the man and a woman were walking to their motel room when it all happened. As for suspects, police say they got away in a black vehicle. Well, now to some good news, and we touched on this in the 9 at 9. Sports fans excited today. University of Oklahoma will face the University of Oregon tonight, the 29th annual Valero Alamo Bowl. But before either team enters the Alamo Dome, students, administrators, alumni, and fans will engage, engage in an unusual pregame ritual. They will help the San Antonio Food Bank fight hunger. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the Food Bank, where both teams are helping assemble boxes of food. And it's, boy, the bands are going too, Tiffany. each university are here. They're going to be working together to assemble food boxes and right now they're doing their opening remarks and dances but something else that's happening this morning they're going to do fill the bowl fundraiser. To talk a little bit more about this is Michael with the Food Bank. Good morning. Can you talk to us about first of all how do you get these two universities to come together to do such a great event? Uh, it's such a great tradition in San Antonio of giving back when the animal will happens. Um, it's just that spirit of compassion and kindness in San Antonio that inspires these teams and so we're excited um, both teams are here to volunteer, not the players themselves, right, but fans and dignitaries, administrators. So they're here. Um, the bands from both, of course, are giving us that spirit to kick it off before they go volunteer. Talk to us about what exactly they're going to be doing this morning. So, you know, um, lots of folks have leaned in over the holidays to give us food from food drives, but we got to sort all of that out and put it together. And so they're going to be sorting food so we can go out immediately to, f to families across San Antonio. There's a lot of happy people here. Um, talk to us about this other fundraiser that is also happening. This yeah, so uh, Fill the Bowl is an effort to exchange food or funds, $30 or 30 cans, for tickets to the game tonight. So a lot of folks want that ticket. Um, this is the best price around at $30 or 30 cans. So that's what Fill the Bowl is. It goes from 9 a.m. until the tickets run out. You can exchange them here at the food bank in person, and you'll get an electronic ticket. How fun. And is this the first time that this fundraiser is happening? Oh, you know, Fill the Bowl. We're in our 10th year of Fill the Bowl with the Alamo Bowl. So it's really amazing and really cool. Um, and again, you can get exchange it $30 for a ticket or 30 canned goods, up to six tickets per individual. While supplies last, it's already kicked off at 9. So come on to the food bank and go to the game tonight and feed some families. Yeah, and you can bring your jersey, spirit, university love, and just a lot of love for San Antonio. Exactly. You know, that's what makes San Antonio just the place I think everybody loves. It's it's giving back. It's celebrating, right? We had our own great road runners, you know, who had a great season. So, yeah, it's a wonderful experience. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll bring you a little bit more coming up later in the show. Back to you guys in the studio. All right, Tiffany, we're just live over there under pep rally conditions. Oh, my gosh, so much spirit at the food bank. That, that was exciting. It's Thank you, to Tiffany. See. 907, about 68 degrees. Still head on GMSA at 9. Cedar fever, it's here. But how can you tell if it's allergies or COVID? Can get confusing. Answers from an expert. That's coming up. The first victim of last month's deadly tornadoes in Kentucky getting a special surprise after losing everything he owned. Max Massey has that story coming up in your morning headlines. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by the Republic of Texas Window Company. Hi, I'm Dana with Republic of Texas Window Company, here to wish our veterans and first responders a very Merry Christmas.
In your morning headlines, the VFM stepping up and helping out a fellow veteran in need after those deadly tornadoes in Kentucky and a home valued at millions of dollars up in flames. Max Bassey joins us live in studio with our other morning headlines. Max, where are we starting today? Guys, so excited to talk about the VFW story and the veteran in Kentucky, but we are actually starting on the far west coast. We're going to start in Los Angeles. We got a lot going on around the country. So yes, it is an update to the tragic story of the 14 year old girl shot and killed while she was inside a department store. So if you take a look at your screen, you're going to see edited body cam video released by the Los Angeles Police Department showing officers firing at an assault suspect. He had been terrorizing a Burlington department store two days before Christmas. Uh, one of the officers bullets aimed at the suspect ripped through a wall of a dressing room, hitting and killing 14 year old Valentina Oriana Peralta in the chest. Now, Valentina's family now demanding justice and transparency for the death of their daughter. Attorney Benjamin Crump reading aloud the mother's horrifying account of the moments inside that dressing room during a press conference just yesterday. I had no idea she had been shot. Her body went limp. I tried to wake up by shaking her, but she didn't wake up. Valentina's father says he will now bring his daughter's Christmas presents to her grave. Now, the Los Angeles Police Union releasing a statement saying, quote, words cannot convey our utter sorrow over the loss of Valentina Oriana Peralta. We pray for Valentina's family as they cope with this unbearable tragedy. And we also pray for the officer involved in this incident as he is devastated over what occurred, end quote. Now to the latest here in Texas is the sto first story we told you about yesterday, a shooting in North Texas, and it ended with four teens being shot, three of them shot and killed. One person is in custody, but today police are still searching for a gunman who fired into this convenience store. So now police are asking for the public's help finding the shooter. Investigators say they now believe that one or more of the victims who were shot inside the store were involved in a previous disturbance with the shooter who pulled the trigger. Now, police did say two of the four victims, a 15 year old cook at the store and a 14 year old Xavier Gonzalez. He played football at Garland High School. Both of them were innocent bystanders. He came just to get food and never came back home. And he, he, you know, we just want justice for him. He was a good kid. Meanwhile, 33 year old Richard Acosta Jr. turning himself into Garland police. They believe he is the driver of the getaway truck. He's now charged with capital murder. Police also say because of a previous disturbance involving the shooter and one of the victims, they believe that this shooting was a targeted but isolated incident. And take a look at this. Investigators in Minnesota saying a criminal investigation now underway after a massive fire destroying this home valued at millions of dollars. In fact, public records show the mansion valued at more than $3 million. Dramatic video showing the massive fire that took over this lakefront mansion. The police department in the area of Minnesota called to the 2900 block of Westwood Road around 1145 Monday night. The caller who called 911 telling police the house is on fire and that someone had candles and gas. Now, authorities reported as a mental health issue. Neighbors said it was a family with children who live in the home. Yeah, they're wonderful people and I just I can't imagine, you know, uh, why this would happen to them. Everyone does really rally around each other and um, support each other. I'm sure that we'll all rally for them. First responders did find two people in the driveway. They were taken to the hospital for non life threatening injuries. The family's dog may still be missing. All right, now to the latest in Kentucky, a veteran who had lost everything when a tornado touched down in Bowling Green, Kentucky earlier this month. He now has a car again, thanks to his brothers and sisters in arms. So take a look. It was a gift from the veterans of foreign wars, the VFW, and the car presented to Chief Billy Burgett, a warrant officer for the CW3 Kentucky National Guard, just outside a VFW post in Bowling Green yesterday. It was donated by another VFW post in Kentucky. Now, Burgett says his heart sank when he saw all of the destruction and devastation the day after the tornado. He said learning someone who's willing to give him a car to help him get back on his feet really touched him emotionally. Waking up the morning after the tornado and seeing everything destroyed um, kind of, you know, made my, a hole in my heart and sunk, uh, sunk down real deep. And uh, getting a call that someone's out there willing to give me a car to help me out and get me back on my feet, it, it was just overwhelming. 
VFW Post 1298 in Bowling Green also serving as a tornado relief supply site. They've received donations from people and groups across the country. And, you know, we've all covered such devastating natural disasters, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's these tornadoes. And it really is amazing to see the community, you know, other friends and family come together and help people like Billy out. Yes, sir. Veterans helping veterans. Thank you, exactly. Max. Thank you very much, Max. Well, uh, Katie Blake is standing by now, and she has, even though we have a large domed facility, she's still going to provide us I, a very yeah. handy <laughs> Alamo Bowl forecast. Did you sure. ever get um, the uh, O fix? Nope. Oh, it's just a regular O. Nope. Same, Surely same did not. okay. Yeah, so for <laughs> those that have missed it the past couple of days, our computer software system has some logo, the NFL college logos in there. They had Oklahoma's, but they didn't have Oregon, so... Huh. Um, I did my best. Okay, let's it see. Use <laughs> um, you know what? A for effort. I mean, the colors are spot on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I tried. You don't seem pleased. This is, well, I'm kind of a perfectionist, so <laughs> ideally we would have just had Oregon's logo, but we don't. So for our, all of the Ducks fans, it's not personal. <laughs> Doing my best. Um, the weather is actually really not going to be too shabby, of course. You will be in the dome. Uh, but for the weather heading to the game, temperatures will be in the 60s and a little less humid. I know that seems very hard to believe considering how muggy it is this morning, all the fog that we still have around. Humidity is at 93% here at the airport. But we have an interesting feature moving in later today that will help to drop humidity a touch very briefly for us. We'll talk about that coming up. Visibility currently one mile at the airport, also one mile in Bernie, and that's essentially the case around Bear County up by 35 to New Braunfels. Uh, but this graphic where you see the red here on this map, that's indicating areas of dense fog that will still be possible, mainly west of 35. Visibility is still at zero miles in Catula, Uvalde, and Del Rio Rock Springs as well. Um, dense fog advisory is still in effect until 10 o'clock this morning, and even some Lingering patchy fog, maybe not quite so dense, but some lingering patchy fog is possible even after that advisory expires at 10. So uh, this morning, just keep in mind, if you'll be out and about, you may run into a little bit of fog, but we'll gradually see that fog clear out over the next few hours. Just shy of 70 up in New Braunfels and here in San Antonio, 62 Uvalde and 61 in Rock Springs. Our dew points are high anywhere from the low 70s to the low 60s, but pretty much for everyone that's feeling muggy or even oppressively muggy. Our winds are light across the area, just about two to five miles miles per hour in Bear County, but we have several spots with calm winds that will help to keep that fog around just a little bit longer. Fog uh, develops more easily when winds are light or calm. Again, over the next few hours, we'll start to see things clear up just a bit. Some sun this afternoon. Uh, like yesterday, I expect we'll hold on to mainly some high clouds as we get into the afternoon and evening, but it will be another unseasonably warm day. High temperatures for a lot of us back near 80 degrees. Light and variable winds through the rest of the day, and again, a little drop in humidity for some of us. So let's talk about what's going on. We've got plenty of cloud cover, and there's some rain up across North Texas. We've got a low pressure system here, a cold front. This is not the strong front that will cool us down this weekend. That's still a ways away. But what I want to point out here is this yellow line. This is called a dry line and it separates very muggy air from very dry air. And it's this feature that's going to try to move into our area today. However, it's going to get hung up, so it's not going to clear the entire area. That will leave some of our friends down a little bit closer to the Gulf of Mexico with higher humidity through the afternoon. But a good portion of us, especially along and west of 35, should be treated to a drop in our dew point numbers this afternoon and this evening. Nothing too drastic, but it'll be just a little break from the high humidity uh, later on today and even through tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning will be kind of our one day this work week where we'll get a break from uh, the widespread morning fog. However, through the day tomorrow and into Friday morning, that dry line will move north. High humidity will surge back in for everyone and it will be muggy again by Friday. So that does play into your New Year's Eve forecast Friday evening. Generally warm and muggy temperatures falling from the low 70s into the mid to upper 60s with some high clouds hanging around, but rain will not be an issue on Friday. Bigger changes arrive this weekend on New Year's Day, specifically in the evening. A strong cold front will move through that takes our afternoon temperatures from the 80s into the 50s by Sunday and the potential for our first freeze in San Antonio Monday morning of next week. We'll talk a bit more about that coming up next half hour, guys. Thank you, Katie Blake. Right now, 920, about 68 degrees. All right, coming up, Tiffany Wetbuzz has a preview of what's after the break. 
Oklahoma and Oregon fans are teaming up to fight hunger. Coming up, how they're coming together before tonight's big Valero Alamo Bowl game. Sports fans, excited today. The University of Oklahoma will face the University of Oregon tonight at the 29th annual Valero Alamo Bowl. But before either team enters the dome, students, administrators, alumni, and fans engage in an unusual pregame ritual. They'll help the San Antonio Food Bank fight hunger. All right, Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the Food Bank, where both universities are helping assemble boxes of food. Things seem to have quieted down, Tiffany. Earlier, there was a full-on pep rally going on. <laughs> That's right, but we're just moving. The food bank is huge, so right now we're in another part of the warehouse. Just check it out. There's dozens of volunteers here this morning. We have alumni, staff, students, fans, all from the two universities, all coming together to fight hunger. And to talk a little bit more about this is Eric Cooper from the food bank. Good morning, Eric. Talk to us about this great event, and how excited are you? Well, super excited. You know, the tradition of the Valero Alamo Bowl is really bringing two teams together in competition. And and the fact that the alumni and the students and the fans come together in the spirit of service. I mean, this is a legacy opportunity to help families here in our community that goes well beyond tonight's game. And so we want to wish both teams much success in tonight's game, but we also want to thank both fan bases for supporting us here at the San Antonio Food Bank. The food that there's, they're going to be packaging up, talk to us about who's going to get this food. Well, so this food was donated from our incredible efforts and the individuals in our community that donated in food drives and so the volunteers are now categorizing and sorting it and boxing it up and then it will be going out to children to families to seniors all throughout South Texas you know and to know that volunteers from these two teams help to support that it makes it special for the families that receive this food the food bank has been so busy this holiday season it's like you all never stop you never sleep that's what we always say but talk to us about this other fundraiser happening outside as well well part of the alamo bowl game is the opportunity to help fill the bowl right as in providing a meal and so the great folks at the Alamo Bowl have given us some tickets, compliments of Valero, and we use those tickets to host a food drive. So individuals that maybe couldn't get tickets to the game can donate food in exchange for getting tickets to go to tonight's game. So if you want to go, you got to show up quickly because those tickets are going to go fast, but it will raise a lot of food that again will go help feed children, families, and seniors throughout South Texas. That's what it's all about this holiday season. Thank you so much for joining us Thank this morning. Thank you. Well, thanks for go being here. And again, best of luck to both Oregon and to Oklahoma in tonight's game. Thanks so much. Well, coming up in just a little bit, we're going to hear from some fans, and you know that's so exciting. Back to you guys in the studio. Awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Tiff. All right, there's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. Dozens of Spurs-themed murals exist in San Antonio, so what's the special meaning behind some of them? We have that story ahead in this week's edition of If These Walls Could Talk. But first, we have a local allergy expert on standby. We're asking questions about cedar fever and how you can tell apart allergies from COVID or the flu. Welcome back 930. Take a look at this. It's that time of year again. Pollen flying off cedar trees like clouds of dust. This video shot by a San Antonio woman. She was walking with her kids at the Cibolo Nature Center out in the Bernie area. Oh my God, that makes me itchy just <laughs> looking at it. All yeah. right, so this kind of extreme pollen is what causes all the bad allergies this time of year and something we know as cedar fever. For more details on how you can combat cedar fever or at least try to control what's going on with your sinuses, we bring in with a local allergist, Dr. Kurt Weibel. Good morning. Good morning, thanks for having me. Kirk, first off, can you, and this, I know we've got you on the hot seat here, but can you help us distinguish allergy symptoms from say the common cold or COVID or the flu? So it's gonna to be tough for a number of those symptoms. You know, as we know, all the things you mentioned, Omicron, viral illness, allergies, can cause runny nose, congestion, mucus drainage, sometimes sore throat, but allergies should not cause fever, it should not cause severe headaches or chills or body aches. I'd be more worried about a viral illness. And of course, Omicron is sweeping the country right now. Okay, so most people who are from San Antonio, they're used to this kind of thing. But for those who may be new to the area or new to Texas or people that are in town for the Alamo Bowl, 
What is cedar fever? Yeah, so cedar fever is a term sort of colloquially used to say your body is getting inflamed from the cedar pollen. And so we know in central South Texas, our dominant pollination of you know, allergy in this time of year is the mountain cedar. Um, it's a cedar species and the cold weather causes the male trees to release all the pollen. And I love the video you showed because the counts can get crazy, 20,000, 50,000, and it just drives allergy sufferers insane. I have a pretty rigorous uh, allergy fighting regimen, Dr. Weibel, but uh, let's tell some people about steps they might be able to take to control their sinuses when the pollen count is so high like it is this week. Yeah, the first thing I'd say is just let's make sure we're dealing with the right thing. But for most patients who know they have allergies and suffer from them, you know, follow the pollen counts. You guys have nice pollen counts daily. There are websites that show it. So if you know it's gonna be a high pollen count day or month, like it is this week and this month for cedar, indoors and air conditioning is your friend. When you're going outside, wearing a mask can help filter some of that, but it's not perfect. So most patients will find relief with the standard oral antihistamines that are out there uh, in the self-help aisle nasal sprays can really help and so the majority of patients can find relief with some of those common allergy medications. Dr. Weibel, well, I've got you here. I've got kind of a curveball question. Do any of those homeopathic uh, things that you find maybe on, on grocery store shelves, do those things help at all oh, ease uh, symptoms? Like the, the honey and the pollen? Things and and the, the, the drops too for, for local, supposedly local allerg yeah. allergens. Yeah. So um, there's some urban legend and myths. I don't mind being on the hot seat at all. <laughs> <laughs> problem is when you get a lot of these homeopathic drops, if they do actually contain purified extracts of the pollen, if in high enough amounts, which you're typically not going to get off the shelf, um, it's not going to work. You know, we often have honey and we believe like, well, the honey must contain pollens, but it actually has the, the nectar from the flowers. It doesn't have like the cedar pollen or ragweed pollen. So to me, homeopathic things that can help are like a saltwater rinse. Um, there are many versions of that um, that you can get off the counter and just getting the mucus and the snot out of the nose, especially if it starts getting discolored or thick, hopefully that will stave off a sinus infection. But a lot of times that's not enough and so we need those um, more deliberate oral antihistamines, nasal sprays, sometimes allergy eye drops. Well, you've handled the curveball question like a total pro, Dr. Weibel. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirk Weibel with the Aspire Allergy and Sinus here in San Antonio. Thank you, Thank you so much. Happy New Year, sir. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Happy New Year to you guys as well. Thank you, Dr. Weibel. Not that we were asking any of those questions for personal benefit. Yeah, yeah, we were. <laughs> yes, we were. Yeah, we were. It was like a personal doctor's appointment. Man, look at that log out there. Oh, uh, yeah. Is this getting worse from the start of the um, show, Katie? No, it, it looks pretty similar, and it's a lot better than it was before the sun came up this morning, but it's it's lingering. It's going to take its time getting out of here this morning, but by this afternoon, we'll see a bit more sun, and that'll help to warm us up. We'll talk more about our weather forecast coming up a bit later on in this half hour, but on the topic of allergens and pollen, this is a really handy schedule that Sarah Spivey put together for us. Look at all, look at all of our little allergens through the year, all of our little pollens that we're treated to. Um, this is a, a really handy thing to have, especially for people that may be new to the area. Um, this is online. Uh, on KSAT.com in an allergen article. If you just search for um, allergens or pollen, you'll be able to find it. But there's mountain cedar, the second one there on the left-hand side. Mountain cedar season typically does run from December through mid-February. We usually say until about Valentine's Day, we'll have these spikes in the mountain cedar count, especially when there are gusty north winds in place. Here is today's pollen count. Mountain cedar is still very high with a count of nearly 15,000. Yesterday, it was 21,000. So it has gone down, but still considered very high. Molds are moderate today with a count of 730. We do have gusty north winds in the forecast this weekend behind our next strong cold front. More on that and another look at uh, the first few days of 2022 coming up in your full forecast. Guys, back to you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, that fog still kind of hanging around, like Katie mentioned, but if you're going to be out in the road, make sure to take it slow in the area. Did, and oh, okay, sorry, I thought Stephen Cavazos just walked in. Never mind. <laughs> That's Max hanging out. Sorry, Max, you confused me. You're in the traffic center. This is like the waiting area. <laughs>
All right, we'll talk to Max coming up. Oregon and OU fans teaming up to fight hunger before the 29th annual Valero Alamo Bowl right here in San Antonio tonight. Students, administrators, alumni, and fans of each university are at the San Antonio Food Bank to volunteer. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the Food Bank with more. Tiffany. Good morning. Yeah, it's so exciting to be here. Just check it out. They're getting ready for all of this preparation. Hundreds of people are going to show up tonight, but right now dozens of volunteers are here at the food bank. And just a treat for you all. We have Lauren with the University of Oregon and David with the University of Oklahoma. Good morning. And how did they get both of you guys, all these two teams together for one event like this? Well, this is a long tradition for the University of Oregon. Um, we've been doing this since 2015. We were invited by Ohio State to do it, and now we're challenging uh, the University of Oklahoma to continue this tradition when they go to bowl games as well. And how'd they get you over here? Well, when we get, when we get challenged, we step up. So oh, University of Oregon reached out and I was decided to um, heed the call. So when you have a great uh, uh, idea and a great uh, service to um, help with food insecurity, it's just an easy yes. So I'm glad we can make it. Uh, it's been a long journey, but we, we're here. I feel like the adrenaline is building up for tonight's yeah. big game, right? Yeah, San Antonio is the most wonderful host. We're so excited to be here. And uh, uh, it'll be a fun game tonight, but today we're partners until the rivalry, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's bigger than sport, obviously. So when we do service like this, it's amazing. And to also give back to the host city. I thought it was a great idea that your Oregon reached out to us and invited us to, to participate. Where have you guys gone since you got here to San Antonio? <gasps> oh, we've been on the <laughs> river walk a lot. That was really fun for us. We went out for dinner last night, and we've been following our band around a little too. So <laughs> have you tried? Have you tried the tacos, tamales? Oh, I mean, so good. I had a puppy day. taco. <laughs> I've never had a puppy taco. That was so delicious. Delicious. I loved it. You... Yeah, that's the plan today, so for sure. <laughs> so tonight, who's going to win? Oh, I mean, obviously the best team. Of course the best <laughs> the team. Best <laughs> oh, we're partners today. Absolutely, it, it, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I just hope they have a good time. I hope uh, folks really enjoy themselves. I know we've had a lot of transition on both teams. Yeah. And so I'm excited, actually, for the players because I know they get a chance to hear, be here, have a good time, and have fun, too. Agreed, so, yeah. agreed. Yeah. And how, how is the energy back there? Because I know a lot of the, the kiddos are also here, the families, the fans, alumni. Yeah. Yeah, I hear Boomer Sooner constantly, and it's pretty amazing, actually, too. But I <laughs> I, I told uh, uh, I told my colleague here about Oregon's band that they really kind of uh, did a great job today. So I, they had me dancing as well. Yeah, so the mascots were pretty excited this morning, having fun with each other too. So that was good. I know they were all over, all over the food bank. That's yeah, for all sure. Over. Yeah. They don't know how to behave. <laughs> so for people that want to come out to the food bank today yeah. to volunteer, what yeah. do you tell them? Yeah, well, this is a great place to volunteer, first of all. So um, thank you to the San Antonio Food Bank and all that they do for this community. But they can also come out and donate today and fill the bowl so come in donate thirty dollars worth of food and then they end up getting a free ticket to the game tonight at 8 15. so what a way to get back that's awesome yeah, absolutely i love that we're giving just kind of a platform for the san antonio food bank here and for those who couldn't come and participate as well um, back in oklahoma for sure you can donate to our virtual food bank that's right. or our food pantry at ou as well too so there's food insecurity is everywhere and i'm just really glad we're able to, to be a part of that here in san antonio so. yeah agreed and yeah. let's let's be real like who's gonna win tonight like, <laughs> oh no oh no <laughs> Well, if we knew, we, we wouldn't tell you. I already gave my prediction earlier. It's going to be Oklahoma convincingly, but, oh, but, oh, no. um, but at the end of the day, like I said, it's it's all fun and games. I'm really glad that we're just you know, competing yeah. on the field, but we're competing together uh, when it comes to food insecurity. Yeah, and obviously I have to pick my ducks. So. <laughs> Go ducks. I'm sorry, y'all. I have to put you on the spot. Did, live did. on TV this I morning. Know, I know. You did. the hard questions right now. <laughs> right. Thank you. Back to you guys in the studio. That's exciting. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, speaking of the Alamo Bowl, let's get more details about who's playing. I've heard that Max Massey is in the studio. Oh, yeah. He, more on that. Hey, he Max. He subtly came hey, in. You guys, I right? did subtly come in for what Max, it's worth. Sarah, Sarah, this is Far Max. Yes. Into the studio. Nice to meet you. So, yes, right now the Ducks and the Sooners, they're teaming on to take on hunger and it's an amazing way to help out the San Antonio community because you know you see all the bowl games around the country and this one is so unique because you get to help out the San Antonio community. So it's pretty cool. I'm excited about it. But you know what else I'm excited about? The Valero Alamo Bowl. First and foremost, thrilled that the game is still happening. We know numerous bowl games have been canceled because of COVID protocols. But here we are, the Sooners and the Ducks going head-to-head -to -head tonight at the Dome. Oklahoma heading into the Alamo Bowl against Oregon. 
all eyes on quarterback Caleb Williams. So we're going to start with Oklahoma. Bob Stoops stepping in as head coach. Remember, Lincoln Riley stepped into the head coaching job at USC. It has been five years since Bob Stoops stepped aside as head coach. Stoops actually was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame earlier this month, but he's going to be back on the sidelines tonight. Both teams coming in with key players from this season missing. We have some transfers. We have some who chose not to be in the bowl game. We have some preparing for the NFL draft. The Sooners are going to be without four starters on defense, but here's the thing. Both teams bring in 1,000-yard rushers. Oklahoma's Kennedy Brooks, he is averaging 111 yards per game, and he is just the fourth Oklahoma running back to top 1,000 yards in three separate seasons. On the other side of the ball, the Ducks, they're without a slew of players. I think it's close to 30 players not going to be here. The Ducks are without three defensive starters, including all-American edge rusher Kayvon Thibodeau and cornerback Michael Wright. Anthony Brown is at the helm playing quarterback for the Oregon offense, but we mentioned Kennedy Brooks, so we have to mention Travis Dye, the Oregon running back, and he has rushed for 1,118 yards and also leads the Ducks in reception with 41. He only needs 42 yards against the Sooners tonight to become just the fifth Ducks player to reach 3,000 yards in his career. So the game set, 8-15 tonight at the Alamo Dome and at last check, Oklahoma is a six and a half point favorite. Do you guys have any uh, dog in the fight here? I'm just hoping for a heck of a game like usual. Yeah, you know, I, you said, okay, Oklahoma's favored to win. Is mm -hmm. that what you're thinking? Six and a half. Do you think, is that going to be because Oregon has a bunch of players? They have a bunch of players it? out. Uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, he's like a projected th top three pick in the NFL draft. Um, plus, you know, Lincoln Riley out. There's that weird question now that the transfer portal in college football is kind of like, NFL free agency, like, are the players going to stay? Are they going to go? So there's a lot of questions. Uh, but Caleb Williams, I'm sure if you're a UT fan, you know him well because he took over in the Red River Showdown, led, like, a huge comeback, and they ended up beating UT, and that was really, you know, the downside for UT season. So Caleb Williams, he's been great. He's a freshman, and uh, all eyes on him tonight. Well, we're loving the matchup for sure, and if for some reason you can't make it to the game, it'll be broadcast on ESPN. There you go. Max Massey, thank you very much for the preview. Thanks, guys. Okay, right now, 943, about 69 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. Dozens of Spurs murals in and around San Antonio area. Look at what's behind these pieces of art in this week's If These Walls Could Talk segment. Welcome back from 947. You can't throw a pebble at San Antonio without hitting a diehard Spurs fan. The same can almost be said for tributes to the team. There are murals saluting the Spurs on walls all over town, from stores to restaurants to even empty buildings. You'll find paintings of players and, of course, Coach Pop. The artwork not only shows appreciation for the team, but helps keep fans energized. Five championships, a dynasty, Hall of Fame coach, Hall of Fame players. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. These murals also seem to serve as a perfect backdrop for selfies for Spurs fans. In this week's edition of These Walls Could Talk, we'll give you a look at some of the favorites among fans. You can see it right now on our website at ksat.com. Missing some of those faces these days. I know. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Tease, we're going to be talking about one of the former Spurs. Oh, yes. Later on in the show. Mr. Parker's estate, local estate, has hit the auction block for Ooh. a pricey amount. Yeah, you'll, you'll want to see what is, what's included in his. We'll estate. see if we squeeze that in here at the very end. We're turning things over now to fast. Katie Blake. I'll go fast. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the big story in the forecast is the strong cold front that arrives Saturday evening. So the first day of 2022 will still be warm, but then we cool things down in a big way by Sunday. So you are going to need your jackets and sweaters again, I promise. Don't put them permanently away. You'll want to have them by the second half of the weekend. As far as the fog goes from this morning, it's really starting to clear up now, but we do still have some pockets of dense fog down to the southwest, places like Catula. So just keep that in mind over the next hour or so. You may still run into a little bit of fog, but that will start to lift here as we get closer to lunchtime. Just shy of 70 at the airport at 63 in Kerrville, 65 in Del Rio. Our dew points for a lot of us are also in the 60s, so it's very humid out there when the air temperatures and dew points are very close together. Our air is really saturated and that helped to contribute to the fog this morning. Heading into the rest of your Wednesday, we'll see some clearing into the afternoon. Not total clearing. We will hold on to some clouds and I think a good amount of some mid and high level cloud cover this afternoon. Nonetheless, still getting warm again today with highs near 84. A lot of us light and variable winds and also a slight drop in humidity. If you missed it last half hour, uh, we will be treated to a brief drop in humidity later on today through tomorrow morning. 
but then very muggy again by New Year's Eve, uh, New Year's Eve morning. A uh, quick look at the month so far. It has been an unseasonably warm month. I'm going to step out just so you can get the full view of the graphic here. December 2021 will likely go down as one of our warmest Decembers on records. And of course, we'll have the final numbers for you after the start of the new year. Big reason for that in short is because of La Nina's influence over our weather pattern here in North America. Our jet streams are stuck off to the north. That keeps the truly colder air off to the north as well. However, that doesn't mean it's never going to get cold during the winter. In fact, we will see a sizable temperature drop as we teased here at the top of this uh, forecast from Saturday into Sunday, and we'll get to enjoy several cooler days heading into the first full week of 2022. This is a very cold air mass that's sitting well to the north. It's 10 below. That's the air temperature in Bismarck, North Dakota right now. Cup Bank, Montana, air temperature 22 below. So their uh, wind chills or feels like temperatures are even colder than that. So frigid air mass here, it's going to stay off to our north for a few more days. So through the end of the week, we stay unseasonably warm here in South Central Texas by Saturday afternoon. Still warm here at home, but the front will be off to our north. It moves through Saturday evening, Saturday night. By Sunday afternoon, we will have a hard time making it out of the 50s. Uh, breezy conditions, even gusty conditions Saturday night into Sunday behind the front. Then our temperatures bottom out Sunday night into Monday morning. Clear skies, light winds, bone dry air means a freeze will be possible uh, north of this pink line here. Now, the hill country, you guys have already seen a freeze, but formally at the airport here in town, we have not hit freezing just yet. We've gone a couple of degrees close to it. Uh, 34, I believe, is the coldest we've gotten at the airport, but I am forecasting our first freeze here in San Antonio early next week. So some big weather changes are on the way, but through New Year's Eve, generally staying warm and muggy. We'll be right back. All right, coming up tomorrow on GMSA, it's never too early to start saving. We'll show you how to teach your kids to get in on the investigating and become financially savvy. One more look outside with the roads on Trans Guide. 281 at Nakoma, things look like they're, uh, they're sailing pretty smooth out there, and that fog looks like it's beginning to lift a little bit, Katie Blake. Yep, we should be just fine here in the next couple hours, and then just warm this afternoon. Fantastic. All right, a article getting a lot of traction on ksat.com. Take a video tour of Tony Parker's house, currently listed for sale at $19.5 million. Yeah, just $19.5 million. It's in Anaqua <laughs> Springs Ranch community of Bernie, just outside of San Antonio. It features six bedrooms, five full bathrooms, and four and a half baths, while the guest house has an additional four bedrooms and three full <laughs> bathrooms. Wow. Uh, his temperature controlled wine room for 1,500 bottles. There's also a nearly 6,000 square foot gym. I love this. This is my favorite part. He basically has a large private water park, which includes slides, lazy rivers, grottos, and a diving platform. Property also features, ready for this, a tennis court, sand volleyball court, greenhouse, herb garden, fruit orchard, and probably <laughs> one of the most interesting things, a tortoise enclosure. I want to know how many tortoises that was for. If that was just for one <laughs> Two, well, three. Pete, that is Tony Parker. I bet he had nine. Oh, I <laughs> see what you did there. Check it out on ksat.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back at, well, Katie, we'll see you back at noon. <laughs> noon. Noon. <laughs>